Now we get to talk about the best retirement account that's available. Uh, it's called a health savings account. Um, health savings account is very different from the other type of accounts that we've talked about. Uh, and what I've learned is a lot of people don't know how they work, how they actually work. Um, I've gotten in so many arguments with health savings accounts. I've argued with my wife. I've argued with friends. I've argued with family. I've even argued with my own HR department here at Georgia College because they didn't know how it worked, which is really strange because it is an absolutely amazing plan. And if you're not taking advantage of your HSA, you're leaving so much money on the table. So let's talk about the HSA. Very different from the other plans. Um, right off the bat, what makes it so different is it's connected to your health insurance plan. That's, that's very different, right? I mean, everything else we've talked about has either been connected directly to your employer or it's been connected uh, to nothing, like with the IRA. Well, the HSA is connected to your health insurance plan. Um, there's a long history of how the HSA came to be, and I'm not going to bore, bore you with the full details now, but basically uh, something we're going to talk about in the future is when you put money into a health insurance plan, you don't pay income taxes on that. Um, and so the HSA is basically built as part of your health insurance plan, but it's really like a retirement account if you use it correctly. So it's basically an account that looks like it's insurance, but if you're smart, is really like a retirement account so it's got very special benefits um, we're gonna have a whole class on health insurance in the future but I wanted to cover this early because I was afraid that students may drop the class you know maybe, maybe you're not doing so great a couple weeks in and you drop the class and you haven't even heard the HSA what a disaster this is like the most important thing I need to teach you because chances are no one else is gonna teach it to you because they don't understand how it works so I wanted to make sure we talk about it um, but to do that I want to real quickly make sure you understand um, the very brief part of health insurance that is relevant to what we're going to talk about today. When you get your first job, you're going to have a health insurance plan, most likely. Now, there are some rules that allow you oftentimes to stay on your parents' health insurance plans, I think until you're 25. Um, so you may choose to do that, but at some point down the line, you're going to get your own health insurance plan, and you're likely going to get two options, maybe even three. You may get some sort of comprehensive plan. A comprehensive plan basically means it's expensive, but has very good coverage. So if you have medical expenses, your plan will pay for a significant amount of those purchases that you're making. But the downside being is that you're going to pay a lot. Health insurance usually is paid on a monthly basis. So your, uh, your, what you pay every single month, what's called a health care premium, is going to be really high. Um, most of you are not going to choose a comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plans are usually for people that have already have like a lot of, know they're going to have a lot of health problems. And even for people who know they're going to have a lot of health problems, they actually still shouldn't choose this plan. And they do uh, oftentimes just because they're kind of ignorant. Um, instead, a lot of people should go with a high deductible plan. And the high deductible plan is going to be cheap, but the coverage is not so great. So what that means is um, your monthly premiums are going to be a lot lower, but if you have medical expenses, you're going to have to pay a lot more out of pocket. We're going to get into the specifics of this uh, the day that we talk about health insurance. We have like a full day to, devoted to that. Um, but for now, all you need to know about these two plans is the HSA, the health savings account, is only available under this high deductible plan. All right. If you have a comprehensive plan, you do not get an HSA. If you have a high deductible plan, you do have access to an HSA. Uh, that alone is going to make the high deductible plan um, a, a good choice, in addition to the fact that the high deductible plan is often better anyway. Okay, So the HSA is going to be available if you have the high deductible plan. Um, you should know that going into choosing your health insurance because it may be the deciding factor. All right, so let's talk about how this plan works. So we'll start now with the key ideas. All right, maybe we'll dive into the specifics here a, a little bit in a second. Um, in terms of your contribution, uh, the, the uh, maximum right now is $3,550 if you're single or um, $7,100 
if you have a, like a, a family plan, and I'm saying family plan is not really a technical term. Basically, if there's more than one person on the health insurance plan, you can go family. Um, you're not going to have the opportunity to double dip. What I mean by that is if you get married and your wife has an HSA, you can't both contribute the 7100 um, you can both do 3550 or you can just one of you pay the 71 or get the 7100 HSA, but you're not going to both get it. Um, so in that regard, the only real big negative about HSAs is it's kind of a small contribution limit. Um, that 3550 for a single person is, you know, not a whole lot of money. Um, but nonetheless, what you can do with this money is really tremendous, what makes it a, a great deal. So your money is taken. This is connected to your employer. Your money is taken from your income, like with a 401k and those other accounts we've been talking about it, talking about. So, so basically, you're never going to see the money. It's never going to get paid to you like it does with an IRA. It's never going to come to you. It's just going to get diverted into your HSA, and it is traditional because you're not going to have to pay uh, income taxes on it. Okay, so if you put $3,000 into your HSA, your taxable income is going to go down by $3,000. All right. Here's the, the interesting thing, though. It's also Roth, possibly. Unusual to see something that is traditional and Roth, right? Traditional means you're paying taxes in the future. Roth means you're paying taxes now. Well, if you can kind of imagine that you have both a traditional and a Roth account, you would avoid both taxes, and the HSA potentially does that. The HSA is the only vehicle, it's the only retirement vehicle that potentially avoids all taxes. It's an absolutely amazing plan. Um, not only does it avoid income taxes, but it's the only one that avo avoids Social Security and Medicare taxes too, okay? So it avoids all taxes. I'm going to say it again, it's, it avoids if you're a Georgia resident, it avoids federal income taxes, state income taxes, uh, Social Security taxes, and Medicare taxes. You avoid all four of those taxes. For a lot of people, that's going to end up being like you know 35% savings relative to just earning the money without using a vehicle. It's an absolutely amazing plan. And furthermore, you may avoid taxes entirely. You may never pay taxes because if you use the money in the plan... For covered medical expenses, you are never taxed. So if I take money out of my HSA and use it to pay for a doctor's visit, that money that I used to pay for the doctor's t a visit came from my income, not taxed, went into my HSA, and then untaxed again, paid for medical expenses. And as you know, and as I know, medical expenses are really, really high, right? It's a big part of a lot of people's uh, overall spending. And what's considered covered is pretty generous. Uh, most medical expenses are covered. That includes uh, most dental stuff, uh, most medical stuff, right? Surgeries, visits, doctor visits, uh, therapy, usually covered chiropractic usually covered, nursing homes covered. I mean, there, there's just tons of stuff that's covered on here. Um, what that means is there's a really good chance that you're going to find a way to take your, uh, your medical expenses and use your medical ex expenses as a way to avoid all taxes entirely, which is amazing, right? This will save you so much money in the long run. And amazingly, people don't understand how the HSA works. So I'm hoping from today's video, you remember the HSA, because to me, I think it's the most, the single most important thing you can remember the, from this class is the HSA, because I'm afraid you will not get this information elsewhere. People do not understand how this works, okay? So, um, you kind of to answer some questions here that you might have. Because these are questions that I get, and I want to see if I can make sure you understand uh, these questions and the answers to them. I want you to be prepared to answer these questions when other people ask them to you because I want you to not only help yourself, I want you to help your friends and family as well. Uh, a first question, can I invest money in my HSA? 
This is one that I've fought with uh, many, many times with people on. Um, I actually was at, at the HR office here at Georgia College, and they said that you can't inv invest your HSA. Uh, my wife was in a new employee uh, uh, demonstration with HR, and they told them, you can't invest your HSA. And so I literally just showed them on my computer. I said, look, here is my HSA. Here it is. It's invested. You can absolutely invest your HSA. So the answer to that question is yes, and people are going to tell you no. They're going to tell you no because they don't know, and they're going to tell you no because they often confuse it with something called an FSA. So if you hear something called an FSA, you should know this is not such a good plan. We're going to talk about FSAs in the future. They can be useful, but they are nothing like an HSA. One big negative with FSAs is it, the money, if you don't use it in a given year, it goes away. So like it's medical, you can use it to cover medical expenses, but if you don't use it, it just goes away at the end of the year. HSAs roll over forever, just like 401ks and so forth. So if you have 10 grand in an HSA, it's just going to keep being invested and grow over time. You can invest it in index funds, mutual funds, just like you can with 401ks and IRAs. Uh, so it can be invested, right? In this regard, it's just like any of the other accounts we've talked about. So it absolutely can be invested. Second question here, how do I pay for medical expenses, right? If you use your HSA to pay for medical expenses, as I mentioned before, you don't pay any taxes ever. Money goes in to your HSA, it's not taxed. You can invest it, withdraw it, none of it, none of it's taxed if you use it on medical expenses. So how do I pay for medical expenses? You've got two ways. You can use a little debit card that they give you. So I literally have a card, I could show it to you, but it's not interesting. It just looks exactly like a debit card. Uh, it's from a company called Optum that does a lot of these health insurance uh, deals for different uh, you know, companies and governments. It's just a little debit card. You take it to Walgreens, swipe it. You take it to your doctor, you swipe it. If the expense is allowed, it'll allow you to swipe. If the expense is not allowed, it won't. So if I go to Walgreens and I try to buy some um, cough drops, cough drops I don't think are covered, uh, it will not let me to pay for it. Or if I go to Walgreens and I've got a whole bunch of stuff I'm buying, and I swipe it, it will, it will let me pay for the stuff that is covered and just won't let me pay for the uncovered stuff, which is convenient, okay? You can do that, or you can reimburse yourself, which is really easy. You can pay for stuff with your credit card or cash or whatever, and then you can use your HSA, go on your, on your computer, and just tell your HSA account to send you money. You can actually go to your HSA and say, send all my money to me, and it'll, it'll do it. The only important thing here is you have to worry about keeping your receipts. Um, basically, you could get audited, and at that point, you'd have to prove that you really did have those medical expenses, okay? So that's your two methods that you have. Um, you know, this is sort of the convenient method, but the second one can be good here if you decide you want to use a credit card. We're going to talk about credit cards more in the future, but credit cards give you rewards. So you might use a credit card to get the rewards and then reimburse yourself back. Not only do you pay no taxes, right, on this money at all, uh, but also you get credit card rewards that you otherwise wouldn't get. All right, great deal. A third question. Here's the one, uh, number one and number three are the two that I get the most. What if I don't have enough medical expenses? Right, I think this is a good question. All right, I'm contributing the full amount in my HSA, that $7,100. I'm contributing that full amount um, I don't think I'll have enough medical expenses. Eventually, my HSA is really going to start building faster and faster. I got young kids right now, so my medical expenses are high. But in the future, you know, I'll probably have six figures in the HSA at some point in the future. So what if I don't have enough medical expenses? This is a reasonable problem to have. Well, it turns out at age 65, you can withdraw and just pay income taxes. So basically, once you hit age 65, it becomes like a regular traditional account, right? A traditional 401k works this way. You put money in, it's not taxed, but after you're 59 and a half, you can withdraw and you pay income taxes then. Good deal because you only pay taxes once. Basically the exact same thing with an HSA. Once you hit 65, right, a little bit later, once you hit 65, you can withdraw from your HSA and you'll only pay income taxes. But... All right. Despite the fact you pay income taxes, you still never pay Medicare or Social Security taxes. 
So unlike a 401k, it completely eliminates Social Security and Medicare, right? Which is, for most people, a good thing. Social Security taxes, you know, you, you pay into Social Security, you do get uh, money in the future for it, but still most people would prefer not to pay Social Security taxes. And Medicare taxes, it's just money gone, right? When you pay Medicare taxes, it's just money that goes away. Um, so most people love to avoid those taxes, and this allows you to do it. It's the only type of vehicle that allows that, all right? So for this reason, because of everything that it does, um, sometimes in personal finance communities where people know about these things, they sometimes refer to HSAs as super IRAs because they're a lot like IRAs, they're a lot like 401ks, but they have the ability to potentially be a super IRA if you use them for medical expenses because remember, medical expenses mean you're not going to pay any taxes at all on your money. What an absolutely amazing deal. Uh, if you use this, it's going to save you tens of thousands of dollars in taxes in the long run. It's a great, great deal. And I can just tell you from my own experience, people don't understand this. I have many friends that they use their HSA, but they don't know they can invest it. I've had a colleague of mine, a family member of mine, both of them had over $30,000 in their HSA, and they had never invested a penny. They would have had fifty dollars or $60,000 if they had been investing that money, but they just didn't know they could do it. <laughs> it's really unfortunate. I'm glad I was able to help them out, though, and you're going to be able to help your friends and family out. I tell you what, call up your parents. Ask them if they got an HSA, all right? If they got a high-deductible plan, tell them they need to contribute to their HSA. Anybody you know that's employed, ask them, because you can make them wealthier just like that. All right, so I just want to make sure we get this. The good and the bad of HSAs. All right, the good, avoiding taxes. It is the best plan for avoiding taxes. All right, remember, it not only avoids income taxes, but it also avoids Social Security and Medicare taxes, which makes it absolutely amazing. The second benefit here is flexibility. The HSA is quite flexible. Uh, in the sense that you can use it for medical expenses, but you don't have to. A lot of people make that mistake. They think it's only for medical expenses. It is not. Uh, you know, that's added flexibility because IRAs, 401ks, you can't access the money right away, right? You can access the money now. If you have a medical expense, you can access your money right now. When I had a kid, right? The last time I had a baby, I had two kids, all right? The last one was just born a year ago. When he was born, it cost $3,000. That's how much it cost us. I used money that was in my retirement account to pay for it, which was nice, right? It gives me that flexibility to pay with my retirement account. So I used my $3,000 for my retirement account, avoided all of my taxes. Now, you might be wondering, what if I didn't want to use my HSA? Some people do this. You can actually choose to reimburse yourself for any expenses any time in the past. So when I'm 70 years old, I could have then reimbursed me and reimbursed myself for that expense that was way back when I was 34 years old. So I can let my money stay in my HSA account until I really need it. That's not a huge benefit, but it gives you flexibility that you certainly don't have with a 401k. If you want to get money out of your 401k, you got to wait. But if you want money out of your HSA, you just reimburse yourself for your medical expenses. It's an amazing idea, right? Very useful. All right, so these are the obvious good things about it. Um, you know, it, 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 it's really not so complicated, the HSA. I hope the benefits are clearly obvious. You're avoiding all of the, all of the taxes, and it's the only plan that allows you to do that. Um, but it's not all good, okay? It's got a relatively low contribution limit. So what that means is you can't just survive off your HSA, right? You're probably going to end up using the money in your HSA. So you're going to need something beyond just the health savings account in terms of preparing for retirement. Um, it's connected to your health insurance, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but what this means is you have to be very careful of fees, you know, expense ratio and load fees. Uh, a lot of times your HSA will only have one vendor, meaning one place that'll, that basically allows you to invest your money. And when there's only one vendor, they don't have to worry about competition. So you might have high expense ratio accounts. Uh, when I first opened up my HSA, my uh, expense ratio for just like a basic S&P 500 index fund was 0.45%, which is a lot higher than I was getting, you know, in my IRA and my 457B. Um, so you do have to worry about fees. Um, and of course, you have to have the high deductible plan. 
which means not everyone will be eligible. But if, when you're young and you're healthy and uh, you want to have an HSA, uh, for all those reasons, it's probably going to be a good idea to have a high deductible plan anyway. Okay. Um, so HSA, an amazing plan. All right. Again, please contact your parents. I, I, I wish I could somehow make that an assignment for you, but I don't want to. I don't want to stick you with that burden. But I would say, next time you talk to your parents, or you know, you, you talk to another family member or friend, ask them if they have an HSA. Ask them what they're doing with their HSA. And I bet, I bet they have an HSA, but they don't know it can be invested. And I bet they're confused about how an HSA works. You know, send them this video if you want. All right, so we're kind of getting to the point where we have a lot of different plans. You know, we've talked about, let's see, 401k, 403b, 457b, IRAs, and HSAs. Uh, you can go traditional or Roth with uh, the 401s and 403s, 457s. You can go Roth or traditional. IRA, you can go Roth or traditional. Remember, the traditional IRA and Roth IRA are actually quite different. And the HSA is always traditional. There's no way to make it Roth. Um, but remember, if you use it for medical expenses, it kind of has both traditional and Roth components. So this seems like a good time to do some power rankings. All right, I'm a big sports fan, all right? And I always read these power ranking articles. Well, if I was going to start a blog, this would be my first article. Power rankings for different retirement vehicles, okay? When I'm, what, this is something I recommend you do, all right? When you're dealing with your finances, set up your power rankings to figure out where you should prioritize your money because it can get a little overwhelming when you have a lot of different accounts to worry about. Um, and for me, here's how I think about it. At the very top of my power rankings is anything with a match, okay? I think I actually forgot to mention this. HSAs can have a match. And in fact, at Georgia College, we have a $750 match on our HSAs. Works this way, all right? Remember the maximum, I'm sorry I'm putting this kind of in a, in a separate part of the video here. Um, but the maximum contribution for somebody who's in a family is $7,100, okay? And that max actually includes any sort of company match that you have, okay? So for me, we contribute, me and my wife, we contribute $6,350, and we get a $750 match for a contribution total of $7,100, okay? Um, so up, they basically match 100% up to $750 of your contribution, all right, which again makes HSA even better. I have a, uh, my brother-in-law actually gets $2,000 match on his HSA, so another benefit. Anyway, getting back to our power rankings here, I would say number one is anything with a match. Uh, I don't so much care about ranking the stuff within this component. If you're getting a match on anything, you want to do it, right? Uh, there's really no excuse. You want to do it. You want to get as much as you can with a match regardless of what it is, all right? After that, I think it's clearly the HSA that is best. So if you're trying to figure out where your money should go and you've only got $8,000 that you can get away with saving, I would say you start going down this list. To me, HSA comes after anything with a match. So you might have a 401k with a match, an HSA with a small match. You would do those first, and then after that, you would go to your HSA with no match, okay? The third one, for me and for most people, is going to be the Roth IRA. Remember, the Roth IRA has the nice benefit that you can withdraw your contributions at any time and face no penalty, which the other accounts don't have. In my mind, this makes the Roth IRA far better than the other types of accounts that you can contribute to that are Roth. To me, fourth, I wonder what you think is fourth, based on everything we've talked about. You know, would it be the 401k, 403b? Well, for me, the fourth most beneficial account is the traditional 457B, right? Each of these accounts is kind of unique in terms of the specific benefit it gives you. HSA, those amazing tax benefits. Roth IRA, the flexibility. You can withdraw your contributions at any time. The traditional 457B, what's nice about it is, of course, with a 457B, is you can withdraw your money anytime after you've left your job for any reason, Okay. The Roth also has this benefit, but the Roth is quite not quite as valuable, okay? The Roth is not quite as valuable because think about it. If you're retiring early and you want to use a 457B, 457B great for people retiring early because it allows you to access the fund before you turn 59 and a half like the other plans require. 
Um, so what's nice about this is why you'd want to go traditional is if you're retiring early, you're going to have years where you don't have any income. So you would like to have some income to earn when you're 57 years old and have no job because you have no tax burden if you're earning no income. So the traditional 457B, you can put money in your traditional 457B when you're 30 and then withdraw it when you're 57 because at 57, if you're not working, you have no tax burden. Okay, So you're moving money to a part of your life. You're basically taking money from one part of your life where you're taxed at a high rate and taking that money and throwing it into a different part of your life when your tax rate is very low. Okay, So if you retire early, this plan is great. And if you don't retire early, well, then it's just as good as the other types of traditional 401, 403 accounts that we've talked about. So it is at least as good as the similar accounts, but potentially much better, right? The fifth best account, in my eyes, is the Roth 457B, because it gives you the same benefit as this one, but if you're retiring early, you probably want to be earning income. So it gives you added flexibility, but without much benefit, okay? And so basically, you know, Roth 457B looks pretty good to a lot of people, but I might just lump all these other ones together with it. Depending on your specific needs, uh, one of these accounts might be slightly better than another. Um, you know, 403B, 401K, they're basically the same. So we might lump all of these together in sort of the OK grouping. Whereas these up here have something uniquely uh, very beneficial to you, depending on what, you, what you're actually trying to accomplish. Okay, So I can basically show you my situation. All right? I get a tiny bit of match with my HSA. All right, and I max this out. I get 7,100 after my match. That's my first priority, okay? If I'm only gonna save $7,100 a year, every penny is gonna go to the HSA. If I only have $2,000 to save, every penny is still gonna go to the HSA. It is my number one goal, okay? Next, I go down to my Roth IRA and I keep put, putting money in it until it's filled up. Roth IRA gives you a $6,000 limit but I'm married, my wife has the same limit, so we can essentially double dip. So we put $12,000 into our Roth IRA, and hopefully we can do that every single year. All right, I continue down the list. For me, the next one is the traditional 457B. Remember, this is available to government and nonprofit employees. You're lucky to have this plan if you have it. I'm lucky. We put about $20,000 in this one, and then at that point, frankly, we're out of money. So in a given year, you know, this is all our savings, okay? It's great to put money in each of these accounts because each of these accounts gives me something fantastic. And if I, for whatever reason, have an emergency and I need some money, well, if I've got a medical emergency, I got my HSA, right? I can use my HSA to cover medical emergencies. If I've got another emergency, my car breaks down, I need a new car, well, you know, if I've been putting money in my Roth IRAs, I can always withdraw my contributions. Fantastic. And what if I get fired? What if I lose my job? Well, if I lose my job, that's an emergency. I can not only pull from my Roth IRA, but also I can pull from my traditional 457B if I get fired, because anytime after separation of employment, you can withdraw, right? So basically what I've set up here is a retirement plan that's potentially available to me way before retirement. So you definitely wanna think about these things. You wanna prioritize. You wanna be prepared in the case of some sort of disaster. And certainly these plans are better than these in terms of preparing for a disaster. And that's why I prioritize it this way. When you guys get your first job, you know, when you're, when you're looking through all your HR forms, it's kind of overwhelming. There's gonna be tons of things available to you, tons of things to learn. You're gonna have to learn about what expense ratios are in what account. It's gonna be a big mess. So what you might try to do is set up your power rankings. Start at the top, put money there. If you run out of things to do here, move to the next until you're out of money. It's a good plan. I wanted to real quickly actually show you my HSA, my health savings account, because I, I think it's always useful to, to see what these things look like. Um, this is my HSA. So I've got about $15,000 in there. Um, you can see I've got 1,000 in cash and about 14.6 thousand in investment account. Uh, if you're wondering, you know, why would I hold any in cash? Well, a lot of, these, a lot of times these accounts will have a $1,000 cash uh, minimum. So you got to put at least a thousand in cash before you can allow money to go into investments. So uh, to, to restate that, it's not that you have to have a thousand dollars in cash, but to invest any money, you have to hit that thousand dollar cash minimum first. So any money over a thousand spills over into my investment account. 
Um, when people show me their account and they're asking for help, uh, a lot of times what I'll see is they have it all in cash because they don't understand you know, how to invest it. Or sometimes they haven't set this threshold right, and it might be set at 5000 So they got to get to at least $5,000 before they can put it into investments, which obviously is not a good deal because you want to have as much invested as possible because after all, the stock market on average returns about 10%. So why keep it in cash when you could have it invested? Um, here's my contributions by year. You can see the amount that I'm allowed to contribute has been going up. That's based on federal government guidelines. Um, you can see this orange bar is me maxing it out, and um, I'm not there yet. This is routinely taken out of my bank account, uh, or rather out of my income, and paid into my HSA. So every month, more money goes in, and at the end of the year, I will have uh, put it all in. You can set it up where it puts it all in at the beginning of the year if you'd like, um, there's not really any huge advantage or disadvantage to doing that most of the time. Here's how much I've been putting in and here's how much has been spent. All right, so, so in 2018, put in the maximum, which was 6870. Uh, I don't know why that's not 6900. Anyway, but we only spent $2,000 of that, okay? 2019, put in the maximum and actually spent more. Uh, it's easy to have really high medical expenses. Um, so, you know, we had a kid that year and we spent more than we had. So for that reason, you know, people are often surprised how much their medical expenses are. So that, that concern that, you know, maybe you're putting too much in your HSA is really invalid for one, because you're probably going to have high medical expenses at some point. But also too, remember when you're 65, you can withdraw the money in these accounts um, and face no penalties. So let me click on my investment account here and we'll see what's in it. Um, not super interesting, but you can see this is the same kind of stuff that you've seen in, in other accounts that I've shown you. Uh, I've got a lot of my money in just a Vanguard total stock market index fund. Basically, it invests in the entire market and it is value weighted. So it's gonna buy a bigger share of the companies that are uh, have a high market cap and not it's gonna buy small amounts of the companies that have a low market cap. So I've got most of my money in this account here, and if you're curious, expense ratio I think is 0.02%, um, which is you know as good as you could possibly hope. So that's my HSA. Um, you know yours will look probably pretty similar to this, and you need to get familiar with it. Uh, when you get your first job, you're going to be excited about earning money, but you need to take some time and look into these accounts and make sure you understand how they work, because this is what's going to make you a millionaire. Um, everybody, all your friends, you know, they're all going to make money. You're all going to make a lot of money probably. But if you want to, you know, have wealth in the future, it's all about figuring out a ways to save money and avoid taxes. And there's no better account for avoiding taxes than the HSA.